The superhighways that cut through the Midwest today represent only part of the vast change that's taken place in this land since the homesteaders buried in this cemetery first set foot here. But besides the graves of the homesteaders and their descendants, there's another monument in this cemetery. On this piece of granite, there's a plaque that tells the story of the Swearingen family. Families from the east came to the Midwest to settle here, prove up their homesteads, and build a new life for themselves. The Swearingens from Ohio did not make it. In October 1860, the Swearingen family of five came from Ohio in a covered wagon to take a claim near Fort Dodge, Iowa. En route, they perished in a prairie fire near Story City. The father, barely alive, reached the Hoover home and reported the tragedy. He died soon after. The charred remains of his wife and two children were interred here, and a few days later, those of the father. The skull of the third child was later found on the prairie and buried there. Fire that swept through the prairie was only one of the hardships these pioneers faced. Consider some of the others. There was the necessity of making a new life with only the equipment and belongings that could be carried in a wagon. But there were also the problems presented by the land itself. Much of the region was grassland, but small forests dominated by oaks, hickories, or maple and linden trees occurred mainly along streams and river courses. Another major type of environment in Iowa was marshland that remained wet all year. Both the woodlands with their slopes and underbrush and the marshes with their impassable mud must have caused problems for pioneers. And there was the prairie. From a distance, it may have looked like a smooth sea of waving grass, but rough terrain and wet places were disguised by the grass and must have been treacherous to horses and wagon wheels. Things like pocket gopher mounds, badger dens and anthills must have been difficult to see and maneuver around. Grass hummocks dotted the landscape and no doubt were nearly impossible to see and avoid. The Doolittle family homesteaded in central Iowa over a hundred years ago, and this 21 acres of land from the original homestead still stands as virgin prairie, just as it did when the settlers arrived. Lenora Doolittle and her late husband were the third generation to farm the original 160 acres. Little by little, most of it was plowed. Well, it was real hard to plow. It was tough, they told me. And it doesn't plow over like the land does now. It would just kind of hang together, and you sort of made a furrow like, or a ditch under it, or it would go back. It was real hard to handle. Uh, I tell you, our days were almost 24 hours long. I tell you, we'd get up in the morning, and we got up in the morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, they would go down and feed the horses, and I'd be stirring up breakfast, and uh, they would come in and eat. And uh, then, of course, we had cows we had to milk. And the boys worked late at night. They wouldn't uh, go by the clock. They'd work as late as they could. Sometimes we'd eat supper 9, 10 o'clock at night. Prior to domestication of the land, fire was a major factor in shaping Iowa's prairie. It's now believed that the tall grass prairie was maintained largely by fires that destroyed young trees that might otherwise have taken over. Fires like this controlled burn at McFarland Lake in Story County are used today as a management tool by conservation groups to maintain small plots of native prairie. Large grazing animals like the elk and bison that once lived here also helped maintain the prairie, but even small animals like rabbits were a factor in controlling tree growth, particularly in the winter. The rabbit damage here is uh, shown on the bark of the small twigs where they're uh, the cambium layer, layer has been stripped off, and also the small twigs are clipped off uh, at an angle by the rabbit in its browsing. The main tree of, of uh, uh, chokecherry here was damaged by fire and it has re-sprouted, allowing uh, some more rabbit uh, uh, food, but the rabbits tend to the sprouts and keep it down low so that it would be damaged more severely in the next fire. The combination of fire and rabbits uh, keeps this forest boundary from spreading out into the prairie. Seasons on the prairie may be as distinct as the seasons in a deciduous forest. Wind is an ever-present factor on the prairie. Along with snowfall, wind has a major impact on the grassland during winter's dormant period. Total annual precipitation in this area is about 30 inches. Depending upon the year, much of that may come in the form of snow.
Because of the wind, severe blizzards are fairly common with heavy drifting, especially in the low areas. Even though some of the taller grasses will remain above the snow, by spring the snowpack and wind will have broken most of the plants and compressed them into a thick mat close to the earth. If fire sweeps through, much of the dead plant material from the previous year is burned. But if there is no fire, the thick mat of dead grasses and the tall stalks and seed heads from the last growing season continue to dominate the landscape while the early spring flowers are small and relatively inconspicuous. By late May or early June, about the time that the bobolinks are establishing their territories, the grasses have begun to turn green and taller flowering plants like golden alexander and hoary pacoon are blossoming. As many as 300 plant species grow in this particular prairie, and there's a continuous sequence in plant life from one season to the next. A few of the many plants that blossom during late spring and early summer are false indigo and phlox, spiderwort, and the delicate anemone. The blue-eyed grass is not a grass at all, but a member of the iris family. Some of these plants continue to flower through early summer, a walk through the prairie in July shows the height of summer color, with the pinkish-blue blazing star, white spherical rattlesnake master, purple and yellow coneflower, and blue-violet ironweed. It is during this time that the pollinating insects are most apparent. Bumblebees and other pollinators are particularly active on the summer prairie, although most grasses are pollinated by the wind. Of course, insects play a wide variety of other roles on the prairie, too. Midsummer is also the time that the major grass species begin to dominate the landscape. The blue stems, slough grass, Canada wild rye, side oats grandma, and others are the reason this is known as the tall grass prairie. Thunderstorms are a major force on the prairie. Besides providing most of the surface water available during the summer, Lightning associated with them was probably the cause of many natural prairie fires. By fall, most of the flowers are gone and the grasses have begun to change color. The rich yellows and red browns of the fall prairie can be striking and varied. Ripe seed heads are a prominent feature of the fall landscape. Seed heads of side oats grandma seem particularly well named. Milkweeds are one type of prairie plant whose seeds are dispersed by the wind during the fall. It's impossible to know what time of year fires swept the prairie. They could have occurred any time it was especially dry. Sometimes in the fall, during Indian summer, right after a frost, there would be an abundance of dead plant material killed by the frost, then dried by the warm weather. Fires may have been started at this time of the year for a variety of reasons by Native Americans.
The Midwestern U.S. today is most of all a food producing region. Grain and meat production dictate what the land looks like now. This is an area of huge single or double crop farms. Corn and soybeans are rotated yearly throughout most of the area. By necessity, all but a very small portion of the land is controlled and domesticated. The soil in Iowa is some of the richest in the world. For thousands of years, the prairie grasses built up the thick black soil that is characteristic of this area. But the very thing that made the soil rich, the prairie grasses, also made it difficult to turn into cropland. Although native prairie was readily used for grazing stock or to provide hay for animals during the winter, until the middle of the last century, it remained nearly unused for cropland. First, it was difficult to farm the area because much of it was extremely wet. Secondly, there was the deep intertwined root system formed by the prairie grasses. That thick mat of roots made it nearly impossible to turn the earth with the wooden or cast iron plated plows used through the early 1800s. Then in 1837, a blacksmith by the name of John Deere invented the steel plow. It was smooth enough to slip through the wet, sticky soil and strong enough and properly designed to turn the thick prairie grass. Some of the prairie grass was used for hay and then, they, of course, they had to break it, break the old sod, which took a special plow. And uh, and it would have to rot down. I, I guess I wondered about that. You could hardly spring plow in and put plant something in that stuff because you couldn't work it down to the point where you could plant a crop. The special plow that was used to turn the sod the first time in a new field was called a breaking plow. Where you, this is where the sod comes up, you see, and this is sharp, and so it cuts the sod off. That, and the reason why they call them breaking plow is, you see, they're turned. See how they're turned under? Regular plows are just straight back, if you notice. These things are turned, so that'll turn the ground down. That's why they call them a breaking plow. Smaller plots of land over much of the state were tilled and planted to crops by the early settlers. But before the vast expanses of land could be planted to crops, low places, many of them virtual ponds, and wide marshy areas had to be dried out. It's been estimated that as much as five million acres of Iowa's cropland is now drained by an underground network of drainage tiles. In Iowa, there are about 10 million acres that they classify as wet lands. Now that's a little less than uh, one in four acres in the state. We've got 35 million acres or so in the state of Iowa and 10 million need drainage. Now most of that is in north central Iowa, such as an area that we have around here. And uh, of that, uh, roughly half of it's drained. Now we put tile in the ground about ordinarily about four feet unless we're putting in mains and sometimes it may be deeper than that but uh, they're placed in the ground. And in this particular area here in north central Iowa, about 100 feet apart if we're draining the land thoroughly. And though the water moves by gravity to the tile, it flows down and then underneath the earth's surface and eventually ends up in a tile. So there's a slight opening between a tile. Ordinarily, they're a foot long. And uh, there's a slight opening between, and then it flows into the tile and out. Now, uh, we use quite a bit of plastic pipe, too, nowadays, which is perforated. And so there are openings in it so it can flow in. And we have about three generations of tile in, in this country, at least I think of it that way. There's the real old stuff that's put in, oh, something like two spades down. And uh, it's small diameter things, and they put it into the wettest places. And then they came along later and put in a little bigger tile. Sometimes it's deeper in the main draws, and nowadays we go in and put in a, in a system that's a rectangular type arrangement uh, about every hundred foot if you drain it thoroughly. And they were working on drainage in the low places even in, oh, in 1860s, they were spading some of these little swamps out then. What do you mean spading? Well, they just went out there with shovels and and to drain them out a little bit. And then they were also beginning to tile in the 1880s. It's the only way we can get the kind of production that we do. If we want to have 100, 150 bushel corn, a lot of this land has to be drained. Plowing and drainage essentially domesticated the land and turned a complex environment into a simple, controllable resource. Domestication and control were necessary for successful farming, but at the same time, they cut down the diversity in plant and animal life found in native prairies, woodlands, and marshes.
That is, the number of different kinds of plants and animals that existed in the original habitats were virtually eliminated and replaced with a few domestic species of plants and animals. The, the native tall grass prairie was made up of literally hundreds of species of grasses as well as sedges and other more showy flowering plants called forbs. The landscape was dominated by tall grasses such as big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, and switchgrass. Among the most numerous non-grass species were the many varieties in the so-called composite family. Among these brightly colored flowers are the asters, goldenrods, compass plant, and several species of sunflowers. Yellow coneflower and ox eye are also composites. From a distance, these two look similar, but the coneflower is truly cone-shaped. The leaves of these two species are also quite different. The brilliant blazing star is also a composite. Several varieties of phlox make up another family. The pea family, or the legumes, are represented by such species as the vetches and the prairie clovers. Animal life in the native prairie was also more diverse than now. The bison and elk, which once grazed here, have been replaced by domestic herds of cattle and sheep. Other animals, like the smaller mammals, still exist in the environment, but they are a much less conspicuous part of the landscape now than they were in the native prairie. Some of the most conspicuous species in Iowa today are not native. The ringneck pheasant was introduced from the Far East. Insects are common in nearly any environment, but with the changes from native prairie to cultivated land came changes in the types and numbers of insects. Cultivating and domesticating the land increased the economic stability of our agricultural society, but it decreased the environmental stability. The enormous fields of single crops we have today are far more vulnerable to destructive forces of nature. The prairie grasses provided an unbroken cover to the land, so that rarely was the soil exposed. The taller plants acted as a windbreak, so that there was very little air movement next to the ground. The thick mat of roots bound the soil together, cutting down on the effects of water erosion. But when the prairie sod was broken and row crops planted, the land became exposed throughout much of the year to both wind and water damage. I've heard some uh, estimates of the amount of soil that's lost per bushel of corn produced. Well, I don't remember the exact figures, but it seems to me there were more bushels of soil lost in, in terms of erosion or soil that had moved on the landscape than bushels of corn taken off the land. Now, that depends on where you are again. I don't think that happens here, but it might happen locally. If you can find a, oh, a little hill slope here, uh, a couple of hundred feet long or a hundred feet long, and it's uh, been plowed, and it's in June, just before the corn's very large. Why, you, if you get a rain, you can have some fairly severe local erosion, but usually the sediment drops out at the foot of the slope here. But uh, you probably do, at least locally there on a small area, you lose more soil, and you, you know, in terms of bushels, then you take off corn in terms of bushels. Pest insects and disease organisms can often destroy or severely damage single crop fields. The complex and diverse natural environment does not have that kind of vulnerability. Pest species are often controlled by natural predators in these systems. Modern crop producing Iowa maintains resistance to weather loss and disease and insect damage by artificial means. Chemicals and fertilizers of various sorts are used to prevent disease, control pests, and provide nutrients for crops. Fertilizers are necessary because yearly harvest removes essentially all the nutrients with the crop. How do you think the humus content of the topsoil compares now with, say, native prairie? Oh, well, we know it's, it's gone down. We may start out on an old prairie and it's very high in nitrogen and we can farm it for several years and not have any uh, noticeable drop in yield, say, of, of corn. But after a while, it begins to show up, and uh, that just means we're taking the nutrients out, and eventually we have to put something back. Our highly developed agricultural system has become one of close interdependence between humans and their cultivated crops. The human population has increased so dramatically that huge crops are necessary to feed the world. Only a few kinds of plants, 
the highly bred grains, such as corn, wheat, and soybeans, grow fast enough and produce enough edible material to sustain the world. At the same time, these highly developed plants cannot survive on their own. They must have the constant maintenance of humans, the fertilizer, the cultivation, the control, in order to produce such large crops. Domestication and control represent a series of rapid changes in the environment over a span of little more than a hundred years. In environmental terms, that's a very short time. Although long-term change is a healthy and natural component of the environment, short-term change can be associated with major problems. Wind and soil erosion are significant problems in Iowa today. The practice of fall plowing allows farmers to get a head start on spring seed bed preparation, but it also exposes the land to erosion, particularly from the wind. During the winter, wind-blown topsoil can often be seen on snow drifts and in snow-filled ditches. The modern practice of minimum tillage, which leaves a certain amount of plant material on top of the ground, does do much to cut down on this type of wind erosion. In the spring, the effects of water erosion can be seen in our murky rivers and streams, although much waterborne silt does settle out in shallow depressions before it gets to the river channels. Excess agricultural chemicals, including fertilizers and their residues, may often be found in these soil sediments. These chemicals can often cause excess growth of algae in aquatic environments. Domestic livestock may also cause erosion problems. Overgrazing pastures weakens the plant root structure and exposes the field to both wind and water erosion. Feedlots with their bare ground can erode seriously. Nutrients from animal waste in these lots may wash into rivers and streams. Today, Iowa's aquatic systems are less able to handle excess nutrients than they used to be. Marshes trap and recycle nutrients, but most of Iowa's marshes have now been drained. We're concerned about our land resource and, and preserving that land resource and at the same time make a living. And uh, so these are some of the things that we are looking at. How can we farm this land and get the benefits of production and yet maintain our land resource over, over the years and for generations to come. What do you think about the significance of maintaining natural areas like this? I, I think we need to keep some of these areas. And in Iowa, we don't have very many. And I can see at the same time the farmer is concerned if it's on his land, he pays taxes on that. And if he, he pays taxes on it and everybody else wants to use it, <coughs> it becomes a nuisance for him. So. I, Somehow we need to have an arrangement whereby we either purchase these areas and make them accessible, at least somewhat accessible to the public for people that like those kinds of things. Iowa has very little land left in its natural state. The tiny fraction of natural timber left is shrinking. Woodland is still being cleared for cropland. Remnants of the tall grass prairie exist now mainly in the form of small, scattered, publicly owned plots that are maintained by the Conservation Commission. Private pieces like the Doolittle Prairie or strips of land along abandoned railroads. Some like the Doolittle Piece and the state-owned Calso Prairie in north central Iowa are virgin prairie. Although they may have been grazed or cut for hay, they've never been plowed. Other prairies around the state have been replanted, like the acreage at McFarland Lake. There are some significant reasons for maintaining these small remnants. We found that the prairie grasses, once mature, are very appealing to the eye and blend very well with the type of thing that we're trying to do here at McFarland Park, and there's almost zero maintenance. What you're seeing out here, once they're established, is basically the only maintenance. But over a period of time, we hope to introduce many of the flowering plants back into the prairie grasses so that during a, a summer's time, uh, a native prairie is just a parade of color, starting in the spring with uh, bright reds and uh, on into the yellows of summer and the blues and golds of fall. It's just a really beautiful sight. Prairies can be used in modern farming operations. They can be cut for hay, and some farmers are beginning to use native grasses for pasture. The Doolittle family of Story City has sold seed from its prairie to groups starting plots of native prairie grass. But when Doral Doolittle talks about this 21 acres, 
it's not only in utilitarian terms. We have some we've broke up in the last 15 years. And as you come across, on two rows come across, you can tell the difference when you get to it. This is, this is, is new ground. This is just like when Lewis and Clark came. This is, this is virgin prairie. It's never been plowed. Well, there were so many different kinds of grasses. And just one plowing of it, you would destroy those. They'd just be gone uh, they'd, forever. They'd, forever. They wouldn't be here. Mrs. Doolittle, what was this, uh, what was this land like when you came here? Well, it was almost like it is right now. It was just high weeds and grass and all kinds of flowers, yellow and white and blue. And you told me a story about when you, uh, when you were younger, you came and picked strawberries here. Yes, uh, when that's 59 years ago, we could come down here and pick a quart of strawberries in no time. And they were really sweet. Would you like to see it stay like this forever? Oh, I wouldn't want to say. Things change so that um, it wouldn't be right for me to predict that, but um, it's a nice idea, I think. <laughs>